Elon Musk says you don't need any other vision system than cameras for self-driving cars and lidars are useless. Okay, obviously this is something to be discussed, but it shows how important cameras are for autonomous driving. Hello to everybody, my name is Michael Reke and together with my colleagues Alexander Ferrein, Stefan Schiffer and Georgi Nikolowski from uh, the University of Applied Science here in Aachen, we will introduce you to camera as a sensor system for object detection. The outline of this lecture of the Outwear online course is structured as follows. So first Alexander will present you the basics if you want to use cameras as a technical sensor system and uh, after that I will show you how camera calibration works until Alexander again introduces you to the different object detection technologies. And because cameras need a lot of processing power, you need powerful algorithms and these algorithms with support of different hardware platforms, uh, which they also need, um, they are available in different toolboxes, uh, which Stefan will show you afterwards. And finally, Georgi will guide you through a nice hands-on course for lane detection using cameras uh, and the ADE in ROS2. So, take care, stay healthy, and yeah, let's start with Alexander. Hey, very well, welcome to the lecture Object Perception Camera and the score Self Driving Cars with Ross and Autoware. My name is Alexander, and the first topic will be on camera basics. I quickly recap image formation and the basic camera model before I sketch color space and then have a word on lens distortion. So how do we get an image from our real-world scene? Some light source reflects light rays from, from some surfaces, which we see over here. These light rays fall through some optics over here onto some sensor plane. And the op optics can be as simple as a tiny hole in a box, as in a pinhole camera, or a camera with some optical focal lenses. And the image plane over here is kind of the viewport of the camera to the world. Let's have a closer look uh, how objects will be projected onto the film or sensor plane. The light rays reflected from the blue arrow fall through the lens P, which is here, onto the sensor plane W over here. The distance between P and the plane where the projection of the objects are sharp is called the focal length. If the distance between the sensor plane and the lens is not exactly S, objects, uh, uh, the, the projection will be blurred. Um, in the figure it is shown with this uh, small length C, which is the circle of confusion. The diameter of, of the circle of confusion depends on the aperture D, uh, defining how much light is falling onto the sensor plane. This is called the depth of field and is shown here. With a large aperture, the depth range in, in which objects are projected sharply is very narrow as we can see here, um, while with a smaller aperture over here, the depth of field is larger. And the depth of field can be derived with the intercept, intercept theorem. Okay, now what we are interested in when using cameras in our self-driving cars is to de de detect objects and estimate the position of such objects relative to the car. This means that we have to find out the position of objects in the real world based on the projected position on our sensor plane. Um, a point PC given in the camera coordinate system with origin OC is projected onto some pixel P and on, a, on our sensor plane. If we know the rotation matrix RS and the displacement of the sensor plane origin CS with respect to the camera coordinate system, we can calculate um, the projection of PC. Like we can find out where P is located with respect to, to PC. SX and SY is the pixel spacing. I mean, it's good to know where a point in the camera coordinate system is projected onto, but we rather need to know the projection of any 3D world point. The intrinsic, intrinsic parameters are given with the matrix K that we see over here. And uh, this is given in terms of the focal length in X and Y direction and um, the origin of the, of the camera 
uh, of the sensor plane with respect to the optical axis. This is the, this, this is the origin, the optical axis, and here you have the displacement um, or the offset um, of the origin of the sensor plane. Additionally, for the intrinsic parameters, we also have a skew factor, which reflects that the pixels might not be uh, quite rectangular. Okay, this is the intrinsic thing, and with that we can calculate uh, if we had no point in the camera coordinate system where it is um, projected onto the sensor plane. But I would rather like to know um, where points in the world um, are projected onto. And therefore we need also the displacement and the rotation of the world coordinate system with respect to our camera coordinate system. And this is given through this matrix R and T, the extrinsic camera parameters. And if we know this, we can, um, we can calculate where a world point is projected onto our sensor plane. And this we do in the next section on camera calibration. Okay. Um, there are basically two different sensor types for digital cameras, the CCD and the CMOS sensor. Both basically work more or less in the same way. An area of sensors consists count the number of photons that fall onto a certain area of the sensor, which is a pixel. And if you digitize the amounts of the charges in the area, you get an intensity image of, uh, of the image plane. In order to record colored image, we need a so-called Bayer layer. Um, and this is uh, uh, this pattern, this color pattern that is installed in front of the image sensor. It's a color filter in the colors red, green, and blue. Um, and with that, we filter out the other colors. To reconstruct a complete image, we have to use demosaicing techniques um, in places where the re respective color information is not available. A complete imaging pipeline looks more or less like this. The light rays fall into the optics onto the sensor where the signal um, is gained and digitized and stored into a raw image format. Here you have the intensities of the Bayer layer, basically. The next step then is to demosaic the image and apply some filters such as sharpening, do some white balancing and gamma correction, and finally compress the image as a JPEG where you can download it from the memory card of your camera or you get it by a frame grabber. If you wondered why the Bayer layer had more green than blue and red checkers, this is because of human color perception. Also, humans have more um, cone cells that can detect green light than red and blue. And here you see the reception of human cone cells noted against the wavelengths of the light. And based on an experiment by William David Wright on how humans perceive colors in the late, late 1920s, the CIE 1931 color XYZ color space has been established and is shown on the left hand side. Each color can be accessed by, by the triple XYZ, which is the approximated sum of Gaussians as, uh, as is shown here on that slide. Other color models that you surely know is the additive or subtractive color model. The former is used when backlight is available, the latter is used mostly for print media. And uh, on the right hand side, you see the CIE XYZ space and well-known other color spaces and how they, are, um, they relate the colors to the CIE model. Okay, in the RGB model, we have a 3D cube with the dimensions red, green, and blue, and each color is composed of a triple of these three values. Another model, is the YUV or YCBCR color model, where color information and intensity information are separated from each other. Your YUV is used for analog technology, such as PAL or NTSC, while YCBCR is the digital version of it. The advantage is that the luminance signal can be transmitted in high resolution, while the color difference signals C, CR and CB can be transmitted uh, with the lower bandwidth. And you see how the RGB image is split into these has been established and is shown on the left hand side. Each color can be accessed by, uh, by the triple XYZ, which is the approximated sum of Gaussians, as, uh, as is, sh is shown here on that slide. Other color models that you surely know is the additive or subtractive color model. The former is used when backlight is available, the latter is used mostly for print media. And uh, on the right hand side, you see the CIE XYZ space and well known other color spaces and how they, are, um, they relate the colors to the CIE model. 
Okay, in the RGB model, we have a 3D cube with the dimensions red, green, and blue, and each color is composed of a triple of these three values. Another model is the YUV or YCBCR color model, where color information and intensity information are separated from each other. Your YUV is used for analog technology, such as PAL or NTSC, while YCBCR is the digital version of it. The advantage is that the luminance signal can be transmitted in high resolution, while the color difference signal C, CR and CB can be transmitted uh, with the lower bandwidth. And you see how the RGB image is split into these channels over here. Another color space is the HSV color space, where color information are arranged at different angles. We have red at 0 degree, green at 120, and blue at 240. And then we have the saturation value, which is a uh, neutral gray, up to full color information to the outside, the rim of the circle, of the disk, and we have a value which comes from no light to full light over here. Okay, finally, a word on lens distortion. Um, lenses, um, you know, tend to be not perfect. And, of course, this uh, distortion of the... Um, of the lenses give us some, some wrong information with respect to um, estimating the position of a world point with respect to our camera uh, sensor. And um, so in general there are barrel distortions, as you see over here, pincushion distortions or moustache distortions. As these are systematic errors we can use checkerboard calibrations for instance and we count for them in the next section. Hi, my name is uh, Michael Reke and um, I would like to show you the principle of uh, camera calibration. So, um, if we install a camera into a self-driving car, um, and to use this camera as a, a sensor system to detect objects uh, in the real world, uh, we have to know how can we transform our, um, our information from the uh, from the pixel um, plane, from the pixel coordinates into the real world uh, vehicle coordinates to estimate where these uh, interesting objects uh, are in the in the real world. Um, and uh, for this, we need these uh, intrinsic and extrinsic uh, cali camera calibration parameter, as uh, Alex uh, already showed before. So, um, after a small uh, introduction to the goal and the principle, I will show you the procedure of calibration in detail. And uh, finally, I would like to give you some hints on the usage of those uh, calibration parameters. Okay, um, so what we want to do is, uh, if we have a, a picture like this, uh, this is the typical picture of a monocular camera installed in, uh, within a car. Um, we want to transform the uh, information of the picture, what we see here, uh, into um, the vehicle coordinates. So um, we have here some some uh, some other traffic uh, participants, like other cars, uh, and so on. And we also have some information on the road, like the traffic lanes. And um, we want to to have a look like this, so like uh, like uh, let's say a bird's eye view, to estimate the distance from our ego car to uh, other cars and also the distance from our ego car to, uh, to the lanes, uh, if it is the lane that we want to follow, or maybe it's the lane we want to change to, and so on. So, uh, calculating the bird's eye view, uh, this is the task what we have. Okay, and to, uh, to perform this uh, transformation, um, we need to know, uh, as shown before, the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, parameters. So, um, first of all, we have uh, the, the picture given in pixel coordinates, uh, so within the camera, and we can use uh, our intrinsic uh, parameters to transform the uh, image into uh, 
first real world uh, coordinates uh, within the image plane and um, so this is a let's say a virtual plane um, at the focal length of the camera and uh, we, now we know that everything what we see um, within this image plane could be here or could be in a uh, centric projection uh, apart from from this uh, this plane so and uh, but to calculate now um, the the projection of what we see to the to the ground plane so we uh, we we estimate that uh, everything what we see um, in this picture lays in the ground plane um, that is wh uh, why we need the extrinsic uh, parameters so and uh, so with this um, with this um, uh, trick uh, we uh, virtually transform everything what we see into the ground plane and uh, we know that there are objects which are located in the ground plane uh, like the lane uh, uh, lane markings and so on but also the other objects like the the, ca the other cars and whatever are uh, projected um, uh, to the flat uh, ground plane but it's better to have those objects uh, in the gr given in the ground plane uh, than to uh, to have it nowhere so and uh, if we have this um, yeah projection projection to the to the ground plane of all those uh, obstacles uh, and uh, and uh, road information uh, we can use this information to find um, an appropriate way uh, to drive okay so and um, uh, these extrinsic parameters are given by the rotation and the uh, translation vector Okay, so uh, what I would like to show you is the principle of uh, Zhang and uh, he uses a uh, checkerboard and uh, within uh, or on this checkerboard uh, there is a uh, known chessboard pattern. So, uh, so we know um, uh, in, of, this, uh, of this chessboard pattern here the distances of the edges um, be, being apart and uh, so once we know how far they away in pixel coordinates we can calculate um, the uh, intrinsic uh, transformation parameters um, because we know um, how far they are away uh, in real uh, in, in, in real world so um, and to to use this idea um, we have to take a, a set of pictures um, uh, and before we need a set of pictures uh, to do it not only with one picture so one one picture would be sufficient but uh, we uh, we take a set of pictures um, to 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 get uh, a better um, a better resolution of the parameters and the first thing is that we have to detect the edges uh, within the chessboard pattern uh, like it is shown here so uh, I used for that the computer vision toolbox from MATLAB Simulink um, and uh, this is an output picture of these uh, detected uh, chessboard edges so I used here in um, in my example. So these are some some pictures of my home office uh, for sure here in the Corona times, and uh, I used a small uh, checkerboard um, uh, pattern with uh, I think 54 um, edges. So and for this, first of all, the orientation in room doesn't really matter because we know that all the uh, detected points laying within one uh, one plane and um, out of this knowledge of uh, the ge geometric um, uh, um, ge geometric of the of the chessboard and also uh, the knowledge that all the points are laying within the plane we can um, uh, first of all calculate our intrinsic or estimate our intrinsic parameters uh, but we can also um, show uh, or calculate where these chessboards are located 
Um, so these are the chess boards within different pictures uh, in comparison to a fixed position um, of the of the camera. So the camera in in my example here uh, was fixed, and uh, I take six. Uh, I took six pictures um, of the chessboard at different positions within the room, and um, so first of all we can calculate the intrinsic parameter out of that. Uh, so which consists of the focal length, center points, Q factor, and so on, and. Uh, uh, I also can uh, calculate uh, at which positions um, these planes are. So, uh, next step is to estimate the lens distortion. Uh, depending on the camera model that you use and also the lens that you have. Um, so, for example, if you have a, a fish eye. Um, a fish eye camera model and a, uh, a fish eye lens um, then you can uh, can calculate it also out of the knowledge of the chessboard because you know um, the uh, geometric position of those uh, detected points here and uh, out of this knowledge you can estimate the um, distortion um, and uh, once you know these uh, distortion parameters you can use it to undistort your pictures and uh, it is important uh, to use an uh, undistorted picture to estimate the extrinsic parameter. So um, <coughs> to, to get the extrinsic parameter we use another picture also of the chessboard but now laying on the ground plane because that is the plane we want to um, transform all our information into. and um, also with the knowledge of um, what the uh, chessboard should look like from bird's eye, um, we can calculate uh, the uh, the parameters of the extrinsic um, uh, matrix, uh, so the rotation and the, the translation. And um, with that, uh, we we uh, can calculate uh, this rotation matrix R and the translation vector T, and um, so using or applying these um, uh, this extrinsic uh, transformation um, parameters to to another picture to, or to any any new picture gives us the projection uh, of what we see into this ground plane. So um, uh, if it is not really possible to use uh, a, um, a chessboard laying on the ground plane because it's not so easy to detect uh, those points, you can also um, use a perpendicular plane and uh, then you just have to uh, multiply an additional 90 degree rotation to your rotation matrix um, to uh, transform uh, um, uh, in, in, the, in the ground plane at the end. Okay, so now let's uh, have a look on an example. So we see here a um, perspective view onto a uh, paper with some geometric uh, figures on it laying on the ground um, and using our intrinsic and extrinsic parameters we can calculate the, a bird's eye view of the complete picture um, uh, shown shown here, and as we can see, these uh, perspective geometric figures from before uh, are now um, um, transformed uh, to yeah to to uh, to what we what we would expect um, in in real world. So uh, we have here a um <coughs> parallel uh, lanes, for example. Okay. Um, but calculating a complete picture um, in, in bird's eye view um, costs, uh, costs a lot of uh, calculation power and it is uh, in most times, especially if you do it with, uh, with uh, videos, um, it's not useful to transform the whole picture. And um, instead of um, 
com uh, transforming the um, the complete picture, we can first detect objects in our perspective image. So we can detect there the lanes. We can detect there the uh, the other uh, traffic participants uh, and so on. And um, we can typically uh, put a bounding box around this uh, or we could uh, detect a lane as a lane uh, given by a few few points and then we take only these few points uh, of those uh, detected objects and we transform only these points uh, to vehicle coordinates and um, yeah by this we uh, only have to transform so uh, a, a small set of points and uh, this is uh, this needs uh, um, much lesser uh, calculation power than transforming the complete picture so this uh, presented uh, method works works fine um, if we have uh, flat roads on the one hand and uh, if we um, have always a fixed position of the ground plane um, in comparison to the uh, to the image plane or the um, or, or the camera itself, but uh, but in reality this is often not the case because uh, yeah think of uh, driving around with a certain speed and uh, then you uh, then you have to brake and um, yeah your chassis is uh, wobbling a little bit and uh, so you always have a little differences in this uh, transform from the um, image plane to the uh, to the ground plane and uh, also when you when you drive on hilly roads um, yeah you have to adapt these uh, extrinsic parameters to your current situation and you uh, you can for example uh, use the IMU um, to uh, yeah to estimate um, a variation um, in, 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 in your uh, extrinsic uh, uh, parameter needs and um, yeah maybe there are also other ways to detect um, uh, hilly roads and um, then you have also keep this in mind when you transform your um, uh, your your pictures so but the um, but the method is still the same but you have to uh, adapt uh, the uh, extrinsic parameters in that case so welcome back to our lecture object perception camera in the course self-driving cars with frozen autoware i'm alex again and i'll say something about object detection today so the overview is as follows i'll say something about image uh, segmentation introduce the operation of convolutional kernels and show you some ordinary features that can be expressed with these kernels like edge uh, detection or Gaussian uh, filtering and uh, I'll have you know some words on object detection with neural networks and at the end I'll give you a list of data sets uh, image data sets that can be used to train those neural networks Okay, Wikipedia says that image segmentation is the process of partitioning a digital image into multiple segments, sets of pixels, also known as image objects. The goal of segmentation is to simplify and or change the representation of an image into something that is more meaningful and easier to analyze. So remember, we want to find and detect objects that are relevant in our street scene. So we will be looking into two examples of uh, segmentation namely thresholding and clustering. But there are many more methods that can be deployed. Okay, here's a camera image from our car scene, uh, inside, from inside of our car. And uh, I have chosen as a little example here for thresholding um, this, this piece over here, this uh, image over here, which is actually a street sign, a non-parking sign. And um, you see the intensity values over here. For some reason, um, I managed to uh, turn this uh, image 90 degrees, but uh, you'll see the streets and here's the post and here's the sign. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, how segmentation works with thresholding. So the easiest is to separate regions by their intensity values. 
Example over here is a binary threshold inverted. So the destination pixel xy is zero if the image source intensity value on that pixel position is larger than a threshold. And otherwise, we have uh, this pixel will be set to a max value. And the max value over here is uh, intensity of 200 and other, uh, all other pixels below threshold 100 uh, will be set to zero. And this gives us this binary picture. And now we can do further uh, operations on trying to uh, detect further features of, of that. Another uh, possibility for image, image segmentation is to use a k-means cluster, clustering, which you see over here. So the idea is that you pick a number of clusters, either randomly or based on, on some heuristic methods, and then you assign each pixel in the image to one of the clusters, that, and so to that cluster that minimizes the distance between the pixel and the cluster center. Once you do that, you, for all the pixels, then you recompute the cluster centers because you added pixels to those centers um, by averaging over the, the pixels that has been assigned to a cluster. And then you repeat step two until you reach convergence. And in the example over here, here is again the street scene. Uh, you see k-means clustering with two clusters, four clusters and eight clusters. And now with that, you can find um, some reasons of interest in your image. Uh, to do further operations on that. And most of the operation, or many of the operations, um, actually are based on TD con uh, 2D convolution. So here, uh, the idea of convolution is to apply a filter over the image. The filter is called also kernel. And here you see the input image. And the operation is given over here. So basically, you multiply the kernel with the input I image, and then you get, um, you know, the convolution, the convolution value for, for that particular pixel. And also what you see, that the image size is kind of decreasing because you're going over this, uh, um, this image over here. Okay, so you see, uh, actually, or there are a number of kernels um, or different operations kernel operation like smoothing or blurring you can sharpen your image or removing noise you can do edge detection and so on so on so there are many of these operations available and one one uh, such operation that you can use which is a uh, uh, quite um, advanced is the Kenny edge detector which you see the example of our street scene over here on the left hand side and um, this goes roughly by um, first, reducing the noise in the image, finding intensity gradient of in the image by the um, edge gradient given over here, and you find out the angle of this gradient, and uh, then you kind of uh, strengthen the edges that you have found uh, with the non-maximum suppression and hysteresis thresholding. I mean, it takes takes us too far uh, to get into the details, but you see. Um, with on the left hand side with the image you can really detect um, edges and scenes and the next step for that would be for instance to um, extract lines from that image and this is what what we see here so for instance you could do a half line transform um, and it gives us in the tree work over here and the woodwork over here a lot of lines but also very meaningful lines in the in the area of the street and uh, with that you could um, extract actually the curves of that of that street. Uh, some other shape of feature detectors that can be used apart from half-line and these that uh, and the Kenny Edge is for instance you have corner detectors where you can detect corners um, of lines, you can detect circles and there is also a number of SIFT or scale invariant feature, SIFT and SURF features for instance or you could use something like cascade or hard classifiers. Uh, those are often used um, to for instance uh, detect um, faces or something like that. Okay, these were some examples of, say, classical image detectors. Um, in the past 20 years, deep neural networks and convolutional networks uh, particularly have gained immense importance in the object classification. And here is an example of a convolutional neural network that is detecting cars on a motorway. You see pretty, uh, pretty exactly that, that the, uh, you know, 
the net is detecting the bounding box around the cars and the lorries that are driving around here from the front, from the side, uh, from the rear, uh, and so on and so on. So this is um, an example of the work of Chen and Al 2018. So while we're not being able to go into the details of uh, CNNs, we just want to give some ideas about the power of CNN. Um, here's the example of edge detection. Um, left, you see the input image and right, uh, the right image shows like um, where edges are strengthened. You know, edge, edges, uh, as we've heard already, can also intensify uh, with using some particular kernel. And if you do this with a convolutional neural network, you see we have roughly 268,000 uh, floating point operations in order to um, compute the right hand side image here. You can do this also without uh, the operation of convolution by a full, um, full connected neural network with doing just matrix multiplications, then you have over 8 billion entries in that matrix that you have to, to compute. And this means that convolution is about 4 billion times more efficient on this operation. So this tells us also why um, these nets um, are so kind of successful also um, in our online classification. Another strong point of CNNs is that the feature detectors needed to classify objects will be learned in the training phase. So on the left hand side you see uh, of the image this one over here, um, this one over here, uh, shows um, uh, features that uh, has been trained by a supervised uh, learning, uh, by an unsupervised learning, sorry, by an unsupervised learner um, on small image pat patches to come up with uh, important features to detect, um, to detect objects. On the right-hand side, you see kind of uh, the convolutional kernels of a trained net that has been used for object detection. And you see that um, mostly the same features have been trained. And the right-hand side have been trained, so the nets, uh, just by, um, by doing the training of, the, of learning the right classification, the, the net also learned the right kernels um, and the right features in order to detect um, the objects. And um, uh, these features also resemble um, features that, we, that humans use in their prim primary visual cortex. Okay, uh, as an example of such classifier classifying net, uh, we have, uh, there is YOLO, there are some uh, others also available. Um, and how YOLO roughly works is that it divides the image into um, an S times S grid and then for each grid the net predicts bounding boxes and confidence stores, uh, scores that uh, some object is inside such a bounding box. Then based on the class probabilities for detected objects the most likely objects that have been detected are shown with their respective bounding boxes over here and this is what then the, the output of uh, the output of the of the net where you we find you know three objects that has been detected in this this image. Okay, the, here you see the architecture of that net. Usually, you have a number of convolutional layers where feature detection is done. These are the convolutional layers over here, which also reduces the image size to a feature vector, basically, and uh, with a max pooling operation. Um, you condense these features. What you want to have is that also, um, well, you're more, more interested in detecting a feature rather than where this feature was det detected in the image. So it should be invariant to, um, to a position in the image. This is also done by max pooling and some other operations. So the last layers over here are fully connected layers of neurons and they are used to generate the classification output. Okay, while these nets are very powerful and robust in general for detecting objects, they sometimes can be tricked easily. And on that slide, I have two examples of that. On the left hand side, you see um, a, a stickers on a stop sign. And the idea of this experiment was that this should resemble like human made graffiti. And with those, um, with those stickers on the stop sign, the neural net that was trained to detect the stop sign uh, failed completely. It couldn't detect any stop sign. 
And that's to say that possibly if you do it in an ordinary uh, way, um, like with, with uh, edge detection and shape detection, uh, you still would have detected a stop sign possibly. The second example um, is on here on the right hand side, where um, in an image, uh, an attacking noise, artificial noise was added, like some funny funny noise signal was added to the signal, and the net came up with a completely different uh, um, object that has been detected. So from a sports car, it changed its mind to toaster. And we humans don't even see um, this, this noise, this, this attacking, attacking noise um, in the image. So it's hard to see these things. Okay. <clears throat> However, I mean, the success of CNNs was made possible by the advance in computing power, particularly uh, having available GPUs, and the availability of large data sets for training, training the nets. So um, CNN are supervised learning methods, and for the training, training your net for the object classification, you need labeled images. That is, we need to tell the neural network what object, object category has actually been seen in a, in a training image so that it can learn the kernels and also um, the structure to come up with the right classification. As labeling the images is of course tedious and time consuming, it's good that there are open image data sets available um, for training your, your, own, your own nets. And here is a list of some uh, nets, uh, this, uh, some training data sets that are available. Okay, that's it for this part on uh, some really high level sketch of uh, object detection in a few minutes. <clears throat> Here's some further reading of on neural networks. You could um, check the book by Goodfellow et al. Uh, on deep learning and also um, I refer to Selesky's book on computer vision. There's also some practical introduction uh, with computer vision and OpenCV. And of course, check for OpenCV to uh, available algorithms. Hello, and welcome to another unit of the lecture on object perception, the camera. My name is Stefan, and in this unit, I will be talking to you about available toolkits that can be used for camera-based object perception. So without much further ado, let's get started. Let's begin with a quick outline of this unit. First, we will be talking about CUDA. Then we'll have a look at the computer vision toolbox from the MathWorks before we will talk about OpenCV. Finally, we will conclude with a little comparison. So the first toolkit we look at is CUDA. Camera-based object perception can be computationally rather expensive. The computational demand naturally grows with the number of cameras that you have and their respective resolution. Many computer vision algorithms and applications strongly benefit from GPU hardware acceleration. This is because it turns out that you can use a GPU for more than just graphics. You can have a general purpose GPU or GPGPU for short. The benefit here is mainly due to a massive parallelization of computations. So you can have similar things run in parallel at the same time and thus speed up the overall process. One of the main providers of GPU hardware is NVIDIA, who is generally active in the automotive field as well. Their GPUs can be programmed with CUDA. CUDA is often well integrated. There is integration with many frameworks and toolboxes. And for example, CUDA support is under active development in OpenCV as well. To get you started, there are many code samples available, even included in the toolkit. For instance, there's examples for edge detection, histograms, optical flow, and much more. Go and see the samples website at NVIDIA. These samples are provided under a permissive license, which means that they can be used in your own application. 
This provides you with a quick way to get started. The documentation is available online, of course, as well. Let's now turn to the computer vision toolbox from the MathWorks, the creators of MATLAB and Simulink. The computer vision toolbox features many things like uh, machine learning, deep learning tools. You can have LiDAR and 3D point cloud processing. You can segment cluster, downsample, and uh, whatever else with the 3D point cloud data. You also have basic tools for camera calibration to estimate intrinsic, extrinsic um, parameters and distortion of cameras. You have uh, tools for 3D vision and stereo vision. You can extract 3D structures from a scene and more. You have feature detection, extraction, and matching algorithms and tools, and you can do object tracking and motion estimates. There's an open CV interface, and there's even possibilities to perform code generation. The computer vision toolbox has a couple of requirements such as MATLAB, obviously, and the image processing toolbox. And you can unlock even more power with additional recommended toolboxes. For example, uh, for more options to acquire images, you can use the image acquisition toolbox. For learning-based object detection and classification, you'd need the statistics and machine learning toolbox. Um, that is, if you want to use the recurrent neural network object detector or the image category classifier, you'll need that. If you want to have the GPU support, you need the parallel computing toolbox. And for deep learning, there's a dedicated deep learning toolbox as well. You should go check out the examples at the MathWorks website. Again, there is a good integration with other frameworks here as well. For instance, you can even generate a ROS node via the ROS toolbox in Simulink. The MathWorks also offers the automated driving toolbox. It's uh, designed to help you design, simulate, and test advanced driver assistance systems and autonomous driving systems. But the scope goes well beyond um, the scope of this unit. Finally, let's have a look at the famous open source toolkit, OpenCV. OpenCV is an open source computer vision and machine learning software library. It provides many features uh, such as basic data structures, functions, and standard methods. And it also has more than two and a half thousand optimized algorithms available for you. As with the other toolkits, there is a really good integration. There are interfaces for many languages like C++, Python, Java, and MATLAB. It supports most major platforms, namely Windows, Linux, Android, and macOS. To get you started, you can rely on a wide range of material. For one, there is an extensive documentation on the OpenCV website. And also, there's many tutorials, for example, on the OpenCV homepage. There's much, much more to discover and find on the internet. Just go check out. This concludes our possibly biased selection of available toolkits. We have seen that uh, some of the many toolkits available um, for computer vision applications. We have seen that these toolkits provide you with many ready to use algorithms and tools. And of course, every toolbox comes with a specific set of pros and cons. Let's have a quick look at the pros and cons of, select, of the selected uh, toolboxes that we saw. CUDA is central to make use of GPU power. If you have CUDA enabled hardware available in your setting, that's probably something you want to look at. MATLAB is often used for rapid, pro rapid prototyping, but it can also be used in production and to generate code. And as we have seen, you can even generate ROS nodes. 
And lastly, OpenCV is very popular. It's open source and freely available. It has interfaces for many different languages and it's well and often integrated. OpenCV will also be used in this course's hands-on session later. This concludes the unit on available tool boxes. I hope you enjoyed it. See you. Hello and welcome to the walkthrough of the hands-on exercise for the camera object perception lecture of the Autoware online class 2020. I am Georgi Nikolovsky, research worker at the University of Applied Science Aachen. The first part of the walkthrough is going to be an explanation of the exercise and the second part is going to be a guided solution of the task. The learning goal of this exercise is to teach you how to create simple ROS2 nodes, use custom defined ROS2 messages, and utilize OpenCV data structures and functions to project image points to a ground plane. You will learn some camera parameters and necessary mathematical functions for the projection. You are expected to have worked with ADE, ROS2, and C++ by now. If you use the ADE from Autoware, you will need to install libopencv dev first. What is the useful information you get from this exercise and in what context can you utilize it? In modern autonomous driving, camera data is processed in many ways, one of which is the extraction of lane information. For that purpose, lane detectors have been implemented. In our research environment, we have made use of the pre-trained model of LaneNet provided by NVIDIA on their NVIDIA Drive PX2 platform. It can extract and label image points where lanes are seen in images. This data is quite useful, but it can be enhanced by applying the methods of this exercise. With the back projection into the ground plane, i.e. the street, you can relatively accurately predict upcoming required actions for staying in lane or switching lane. You can predict this by, for example, evaluating the curvature of the street in a certain distance. But the evaluation is not part of the... What we are going to do is project and visualize the data generated by the LaneNet model on our NVIDIA hardware. The source will be built up of four packages. The lane detection data loader, where the data and the code which loads the data into the ROS framework is located. You run the software in this package when you want to play the data. You can't stop the data though. You will have to rerun the node to play it again. The lane detection projection package contains the lane underscore detection underscore projection dot cpp file, in which you will need to solve task 1 and 2. Lane detection visualization contains the lane underscore detection underscore visualization dot cpp file, in which you will need to solve task 1 and 3. Lane messages is a package containing custom messages, which you will make use of in this task. Before you arrive at the tasks, you will see a couple of infos which may help you in solving the task. It is recommended to read up the complementary documentation of the OpenCV data structures and functions. The listed OpenCV data structures and functions suffice to solve the task too. Now about the tasks. You are expected to mainly change code in the files lane underscore detection underscore projection dot cpp and lane underscore detection underscore visualization dot cpp. The lines of code you should replace are the commented lines beginning with the word task and a number. In task 1 you will have to create subscriptions and publishers with the goal of getting the data from the data loader, with the goal of getting the data from the data loader to the projection logic and 
then into R. In task 2 you will have to implement the back projection. You can follow the procedure described in the task to get the expected solution, but you can solve it your own way. Last but not least, you will implement a simple visualization for the projected lanes in task 3. It should be noted though, that you will be working with only two lanes, the left nearest and the right nearest. They are also called the ego lanes. Ok, this wraps up the first part of the walkthrough. Next up is the recorded solution with explanation. Task 1. For this task, we need to first define the publisher and subscription in lane underscore detection underscore projection dot cpp. And looks like this. Then you create the publisher and subscription in the constructor. When creating publisher, you use lane underscore markings underscore left underscore right underscore projected and a message queue of length 10. The subscription subscribes to lane underscore marking underscore left underscore right and has a message queue of 10. The data will be received in a callback which I name here lane marking callback. The publisher will publish messages of type lane marking projected array both because in this message type we have markings left and marking right which represent the left and right lane. And it subscribes to lane marking array both, which is a message type that has markings left and markings right representing the left and right lane, this time only in image coordinates. Now we just have to add the signature of the callback function we bind here, called lane mark marking callback, And we are finished in this file for task 1. Now let's go to lane underscore detection underscore visualization.cpp and proceed with similar steps. First we define the publisher and subscription. Then we create the publisher and subscription in the constructor. The publisher publishes messages of type marker to the topic visual feedback. The subscription subscribes messages of type lane marking projected array both, which conveniently is the type we publish in the lane underscore detection underscore projection. It also subscribes to the same topic as we publish in our projection node. The callback function is already in the file, so we don't need to define it again. Now that we can access the data, we can implement the projection. This is part of task 2. In the callback function, we defined in the file lane underscore detection underscore projection dot cpp, we need to define the message we will publish. The message will be of type lane marking projected array both. Then we check the left lane part of the lane marking array both message on whether it is empty. If it is not empty, we create a container CV mat and a destination CV mat. CV mat is a data structure which represents a matrix in OpenCV. It is implemented as a general storage data structure in OpenCV and can be used with many functions. Now we fill the container with the points of the left lane. Once we fill the container, we call OpenCV's undistored points function. This function fills the destination CV mat with undistorted points in the image plane. What mathematically happens is that undistorted points multiplies the image points, i.e. the coordinates of the lane markings of our left lane in this case, with the inverse of the 
intrinsic calibration matrix. The intrinsic calibration matrix we pass here can be located in the matrix defines.h file. What is next is to reverse the effects of the extrinsic translation and rotation on our points. This can be achieved in a single step. Our approach was to first remove the rotation, then scale and then compensate the translation. Because we want to apply this to each point, we use a mat iterator to iterate through the 2D points stored in our destination CV mat. To reverse the rotation, we morph the 2D point into a homogeneous vector by adding a third dimension and setting it to 1. This is useful because we can then multiply a vector with the 3 by 3 matrix. This added di dimension represents not the Z coordinate, but the scaling factor. We can now apply the inverse rotation to the homogeneous vector by multiplying with the inverse rotation matrix also located in the matrix defines h file. Afterwards, we need to scale the rotated vector to match the scaling of the translation vector. As we want to scale into the xy plane, the z coordinate becomes the scaling factor of the translation. Our calculation was to normalize the rotated vector so that the scaling factor is 1 and then multiply x and y coordinates by the scaling of the translation vector. For convenience we stored the translation vector also in a CV mat called transform matrix which you can find in matrixdefines.h. At last we can compensate the translation in X and Y and store the projected point in a custom defined lane marking projected message and add it to the resulting points for the left lane. For the right lane we repeat the same procedure and once all calculations are done we publish the results. The third and last task is to take the results produced by the code in task 2 and visualize them appropriately. For that we use ROS2's visualization messages. First we define two marker messages, one for each lane. Then we fill them with the default information i.e. world origin as pose and zero rotation. The scaling and color are optional. You can choose any uh, color you want. The most important part is that you define them as type line strip. Then we fill the points field in the message with the data from the corresponding lane. First for the left lane, and then for the right lane. Now we can publish both markers and we should see our lanes visualized. Let's test our software. For that we open a terminal and navigate to the camera hands-on workspace. If you are using ADE you will need to install libopencvdev. Once you've done that you can execute call can build. Now I will create four terminals. Also, I need to enter ADE again. Okay, so... Okay, now in the four terminals I've created, I've sourced the install setup.bash to be able to ROS2 run my nodes. And now I will start by ROS2 running the data loader node. Then in the second terminal, I will ROS2 run and in the third, I will ROS2 run my lane detection visualization node. Once all nodes are up and running, we can start Arvis in the fourth terminal. And then we have this UI. First, we will see nothing, and then we can add a uh, visualizable topics, for example the image, which is the video of the lane detection, and the lane markings, published in the visual feedback topic. And that's it. What we see now is the ground projection from the origin of the map coordinate frame
And with this, you can now calculate curvatures and predict the next curvature in a certain distance.